for another edition of our Spin Sheet Happy Hour, sponsored by our friends from Mount Gay Rock. Uh, if you are in your favorite uh, spirit house looking for something to refresh yourself with and you like rum, make it Mount Gay Rum. You'll be helping us out and you'll be helping yourself out too. Um, so today we're going to be talking about finding and managing racing crew. We got some great guests, and uh, but before we get started, I'm going to bring on our editor extraordinaire, Miss Molly Winans. Welcome, Mr. Molly. Hello. Bonsoir, Sharb. How are you? I'm doing well. Happy Friday. It is one damn nice Friday. It is. Yeah, I got. I got to tell you something, and maybe the folks from Mount Gay are listening, but I have in the background. My Mount Gay jacket on the back of my chair, and I'm wearing a short sleeve shirt because it's just too hot in here to wear my Mount Gay jacket. And I didn't feel like wearing a hat because sometimes I look down. I don't want everybody just to be looking at the brim of my hat all night. So, in case someone from Mount Gay is listening, I I really could use a summer version of Mount Gay. Where I just you know a cute. I like those cute little T-shirts that they. I really want the cute red T-shirt. That's what I want. So anyway, if, if one of those happens to become available, I would wear it gladly anytime. It's Finchy Happy Hour. But in the meantime, I'm just gonna drink some Mount Gay rum. How about you? What are you drinking over there? Uh, I am drinking Mount Gay uh, with ginger beer, and because it's so nice out, I got the extra big mason jar. No. <laughs> this is like, it this, is a happy Friday. <laughs> this is a big bulk version of. Uh, well, I went and changed it up on you because I have absolutely no mixers in my refrigerator. But I dug around in there, and I still have that that um, cranberry juice that I accidentally bought that was uh, has no sugar in it. <laughs> Don't get Trader Joe's. Um, cranberry juice. It's just so bad. But for some reason, I haven't thrown it away yet. So that's in there. And um, and in the very back, I found one little bottle of tonic and it said April 20 is an expiration date. And I cracked it open and it wouldn't open. I actually had to run it under hot water. I opened it and it still has a little fizz in it. So I'm having a Mount Gay and tonic. Excellent. Very, it's a very summary. It's sort of fitting to this weird, warm, windy day that we're having. I'm loving it, and I if um, hopefully people are following us on Facebook because I saw your post uh, today because it's just blowing like crazy out there, and um, Steve Birchfield just just uh, uh, gave us like a towards tail on an empty bank account. Very nice, thank I, you, Stephen. I think well, that's true. that whole thing on Facebook started because I I, I um, really Keyworth posted a photo from. A couple of days ago where there was absolutely no wind and the folks from the varsity offshore sailing team and the naval academy was out there were out there when there was zero wind and obviously was not today and i wrote i wonder if they're out there today it's blowing dogs off chains and he said it's blowing cops out of donut shops <laughs> <laughs> and i thought oh there are all kinds of stuff out there i, I did um there was at least one dirty one came in and i hit it it's a family program it's a family program we don't need that crap what did you Keep clean people <laughs> you know you know our clientele you know who we are here. i do that's why i i, I stayed there until I, I stayed there ready to hide <laughs> ready to hide them and, and if there were five dirty comments i would have deleted the whole thing game over people game yeah. over it's a family show come on awesome so uh should we bring out our guests yeah you know and these guests are so cool because we had, I had some planning to do. We got real busy in our spin sheet deadline and I was planning, planning, planning these happy hours and I forgot about tonight. So I have April all planned and then I realized, oh my gosh, I have four days to get some guests. I hadn't even asked any, I didn't have, so, um, so I thought one of the very best crews I have ever sailed with um, are uh, Keith and uh, Keith. Mays and Emily Manders on Jubilee out of Harrington Harbor. So I, I sent Keith the text and he said, let me ask Emily when she gets home tonight. So they agreed to it. I shot a note over to Clark McKinney down in Solomon's. He said, sure, I'm game. So that's who we have on the program tonight. And uh, these are some people who have some experience organizing crews and gathering crews and have some good tips for all of us. So anyway, yeah, let's, let's bring them on. Let's uh, get this party started. There they are. All Hi, right. Clark. Hi, Keith and Emily. Hi. Hi, Welcome. Yes. 
You guys are all first time guests on the Spin Sheet Happy Hour, so we're very happy to have you here. What are you, what are you drinking down there in Solomon's, Clark? Well, we like Mount Gay also. Yeah. And <laughs> today we're mixing it with ginger ale because uh, my father in law was a Seagram's uh, salesman, and we're having Seagram's ginger ale with our best or favorite rum, anyways. Favorite Fantastic. Rum. How about you, Keith and Emily? What are you guys drinking? Well, it turns out I'm having a Mount Gay and tonic. Oh, all yeah. right. Cheers. That's Summer what drinks. I'm having, too. Yeah, yeah. It's good, isn't it? Summer drink. Yeah. How about you, Emily? Well, I'm having a drink I call a Jubilee because I actually thought that I made it up on the boat. Um, but it's a Moscow Mule. <laughs> so I was super excited. Um, but then I found out that it wasn't an original. So it's my... All right, well, you know, we try to do cheers toward the center. If yeah, you can figure out which way is center, it takes a minute to figure out. Yeah, yeah there you go. Cheers. Nice. Nice job. There we go. You guys are pros. Yeah. Not everybody gets there right in the first try. So awesome. anyway, it's a little counterintuitive because it's a mirror, a mirror thing happening here. But anyway, Sharp, are you going to go behind the scenes, be the man behind the curtain so we can start talking about sailboat racing? I'm going to do what I do. You all have fun. I'll see you at the uh, last call. All right, Sharp. Thank you. So just so everyone, everyone who's in our audience tonight, thanks for watching the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. And you kind of know the deal. Feel free to pop a question into the comments at any time. And we'll we'll either get to it when we're, when we're on that topic or we, we might interrupt for questions. It kind of depends on how things go. But we do like to start at the beginning. And we like to hear about everyone's sailing background, um, how the, what kind of racing they're doing now, and kind of what makes you an expert in this topic of, you know, bringing crew on, <laughs> finding crew and managing crew and training them up. So we're going to start with you, Clark. All right. Well, I guess sailing started uh, as a, maybe a seven-year-old in Ocean City and sailing in Asawoman Bay. And the best thing I could do was go downwind and rendezvous with my mother who had a uh, convertible VW Bug. And we put the little sailboat on top and drive back down to Ocean Highway. <laughs> and I got to splurge one time and get a Sunfish rental. And then I could actually go upwind a little bit too. And eventually we uh, changed residence and moved to St. Mary's County, Leonard Town. And my father was looking for something to keep his two sons out of trouble. He ran into an associate and asked, uh, well, if I got a catamaran like yours, would it keep my boys out of trouble? Well, it all opened the door to trouble, and uh, we've enjoyed it the rest of our life. And that was in the 70s. And so that was easy to find crew. Uh, my next-door neighbor uh, was a crew until he bought a, a catamaran similar. Uh, and then I had uh, my wife, Mary, and joined as crew on the boat. And... That sealed the deal that she was uh, worthy of marrying. And uh, we had a little tale about that one, but I don't want to divulge. Maybe she comes in, she could talk about it. And uh, then it led into um, going to St. Mary's College and getting hooked up with a bunch of sailors from Annapolis. And they introduced me to dinghy sailing. And I never did very well there. And so then I graduated from St. Mary's, got a job in Solomon's at Sennheiser's and was a rigger. Decided I'd get a little Ranger 23 and gone through, I don't know, 10 boats and mostly sailing uh, my own boats around the Chesapeake, but we've gone elsewhere. Um, and currently have a Melges 32 in partnership. So, and we're getting ready to tow it to Charleston Raceway. So. All right. We have a, someone just commented, a good way to keep crew, marry them. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like that kind of worked for That's you very too. very important to have uh, a mixed company on any boat, for sure. Yeah. So Keith and Emily, I, I um. I know more about Keith's sailing background than Emily's, but um, let's start with Keith and then move to Emily. 
Okay. Um, so I, I bought a boat, a sailboat on a whim that was sitting in Harrington Harbour North looking for a way to spend weekends with my family. And uh, it occurred to me, it was like an epiphany, maybe say something you could do with the family. And I had a, a, a toddler and an infant at the time. So uh, um, it seemed like a good idea. And as it turned out, it was a wonderful idea because I booked, um, not on that boat, it was a POS actually. I, <laughs> you buy something on a whim from a Kiwi, a New Zealander, um, who tells you this is the best thing since sliced bread. You know, you've got to be careful. But at any rate, it got, <laughs> it got me started and uh, I started crewing on other boats almost immediately. And, uh, you know, West River, uh, Wednesday nights and eventually Harrington Harbour. And then, um, so I crewed for, I don't know, 15 years or something or other, 10, 12, I, I forget, um, at my age, um, that happens a lot now. Um, and then uh, in 2003, I bought my own first racing boat. The previous boats had been cruising boats. Um, and so uh, that's when Emily and I started sailing together. And... Uh, you know, that we had that boat for uh, two or three years and then bought Jubilee in 2006. And we've sailed Jubilee ever since. Um, all sorts of different racing. One design initially when we had a, a nice fleet of 36.7s here on the Chesapeake Bay. We went to Buffalo and you know, North Americans, but mostly here on the Chesapeake Bay and uh, here at Harrington Harbour. Heavy campaign initially and then more less uh, frequently weekends in particular when you're a yacht broker they you know people want you to work on weekends and not sail so anyway now that i'm retired planning to get back into some weekend racing um in, here at harrington as well as up in annapolis and up and down the bay before i get too old <laughs> so I'll, I'll never forget years ago i interviewed you keith and uh, you know it might have been 10 years ago at this point, remember that? And um, I, uh, and as I always do whenever I'm interviewing sailboat racers in particular, I always ask, do you have any non-sailing passions? And they almost always say, oh yeah, I, um, I'm a skier and I blah, 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 blah. And Keith thought about it, non-sailing passions. And then he said, no. <laughs> <laughs> nope, none. And no one ever said that before. It was great. <laughs> so I'll never forget it. Yeah, so came Emily, why don't you tell us about you and your background in sailing? Um, well, I have not raced nearly as long as Clark or Keith, um, but I was a summer kid here in Herring Bay between Harrington Harbor North and South. Um, so I jumped on little sunfishes and Hobie cats, you know, just for fun. Never owned one. Um, and then went, you know, went away and pursued other interests, but came back to this area. And I could watch Wednesday night sailings from my house. And uh, then we would take a little motorboat out and watch the, the racing on Wednesday nights. And I thought, why am I watching? So I have a friend who was racing and I got on that boat. It was a Catalina 27, which was a great boat on which to learn how to race um, small enough that you different positions and um, did that for several years and then thought, you know, a big boat might be fun. So I raced on a CNC 40 on Herring Bay and then met Keith while we were racing, you know, in the same club and then started racing with him on the Nicholson and then on our boat Jubilee for 15 years now. So she's a good old boat. Yeah. Starting to get the hang of it. <laughs> 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 so how do you guys find crew i know i know that there are lots of different ways that crew come to you and some of them are accidental but why don't we start with you clark how, how have, over the years have you found crew for your boats well i've uh, gone to the crew finding service of spin sheet magazine yay and uh, met some people there that's but that's only been once or twice that we've ever met some people there 
Most of it is just being as active. Uh, you just run into a lot of different people uh, that have similar interests. And I'm not uh, one to jump out and try to uh, find somebody that's actively sailing. But if a, a person that's been sailing uh, is on a boat and the, the boat for some reason uh, takes a break, we take advantage of those situations and uh, try to invite people over. Um, when people come around the boat yard, uh, you know, I uh, keep my eyes open. And if they look like they're interested and they're looking for something to do, uh, we'll start the conversation. And we've gotten a lot of different uh, crew members that way. Uh, and also being in the business, people come my way and uh, they ask me about getting on boats and I'll point them in a lot of different directions as to what their possibilities are. And sometimes they'll show up in my boat with a 12 pack or something like that in hand and uh, they're most welcome on board. But uh, yeah, I, I think that the uh, most, uh, common way. It's just uh, keeping it, um, eyes open and uh, finding people that are in the neighborhood, whether it's at the marina or on the local sailboats and continue to offer them a opportunity to go out sailing. How about you, Keith and Emily? How, how have you guys found crew over the years? Yeah, I think for us, it's been uh, much like Clark, you know, it's, it, initially for us, uh, when we were trying to build a program from scratch, it was word of mouth. And um, once we got a little program going, there was referrals. We used the spin sheet crew finder in the early days. Um, but, uh, you know, networking, um, you know, running into people, being open to the idea of talking to people about racing and being open to the idea of bringing people on. Um, you know, Emily said uh, a while back that she thinks that there's probably been a hundred people that have crewed on, on uh, Jubilee and, and Labyrinth, the uh, Nicholson we had for a couple of years. Over the years, it's just an amazing um, way to meet people. And some of the uh, encounters proved to be you know, wonderful and, and you know, uh, it, it becomes uh, something good for, for both the, the, the crew and for, you know, the captain and, and his team. But uh, so, I, you know, I think uh, in the early days it was a little harder to find good, reliable, uh, regular crew. But in recent years, I think Clark made the point that, you know, you're sailing all the time and you're also, you know, having some success, then you become a boat that other people want to crew on. So yeah, they, they come to you a little bit more when you're successful, huh? Well, yeah, but it's also getting out. It turns out a lot of these people, they like to, if they're not going out one week, then they're looking for a ride on somebody else's boat. You know, some crew just, they can't themselves they want to be on the water all the time so if you're the kind of guy who goes out only when it's nice and you know a couple of times a month then you know you have a little harder time finding and finding those really um, gung-ho kinds of crew if you're out there all the time i think it's easier mm -hmm. so uh, anyone who's not watching the question someone asked mm -hmm. if our spin sheet crew parties were happening this year they are not happening this year uh -huh. this pandemic thing is still happening so, uh, so therefore, we will not be having any live crew parties this year, um, but we are having tonight and uh, toward the end of April, we're going to have another night where we talk about um, how to raise your game a little bit as a crew member on a boat. But tonight, we're just going to talk a little bit more from the boat owner's perspective. And I'm going to ask you, Clark, what kind of qualities do you seek in a crew? And that can be physical and you know, emotional and personality and all that kind of stuff. So what, 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 what do you need on your boat? Well, the, the hardest one to find to fill is the social chairman. 
because we have a very good time on the, most of the boats that I'm on. And um, we always looking for the person that has maybe the most jokes and they don't necessarily have to be the best sailor by any means. And, and just as long as we have a communication line that brings the rest of the crew together, we'll make it work. Um, so that's the most difficult person to find. Um, then we just uh, go through and we try to find people to fit particular spots. And um, like I say, if we're just picking up crew, we will work through whatever it is for, you know, the day or the week or the month or the year. And, you know, we try to have a little bit of communication uh, during the race, but mostly we try to talk about things after the race. And, um, and then we hopefully we're offering something to feed their desire to learn and develop their skills. And meantime, we're all having a good time with the social and the social is huge. So, and that's the way it all began when I first started sailing was, it was totally social and uh, the competitiveness was, yeah, I was competitive, but I didn't know. Uh, where I was in, in uh, say, in my level of, of uh, expertise. And so we were just learning. So we really didn't know anything. So it was mostly just getting out there with your buddies and uh, girlfriends or whatever and, and, and wife and uh, sailing and, and having a good time. So I don't know if I'm helping, but. Um, Mom, I had an ambulance or something coming by. How about you, Keith and Emily? Um, what uh, what kind of qualities do you look for in sailing crew? I mean, I think for us, it's the positive attitude. So you, you come on with a positive attitude, whether we win or lose, um, whether you make mistakes or not, you come in with a positive attitude, um, a willingness to learn. So even if you've been on other boats, um, you, get on here? you might have done not have done things the way it consistently on Jubilee. So willingness to be flexible and, and learn how to do something differently um, on Jubilee. And people who are willing to go out, who are looking um, for the opportunity to race a lot, to go out a lot, because the consistency of you know having the same people week after week really helps to build a successful team. And then if they commit to these races, you know, we give them a schedule ahead of time for the whole year. When they commit to the races, we expect them to, to honor that commitment. Or if they can't, to let us know well ahead of time. So um, Keith is the one who's really organized. Um, likes to know, have the picture for the whole season, um, what the crew is going to look like. And the more consistency we have with crew, um, we do. Um, and we also want people who we would consider having a friendship with off the boat. So things gel. You, you become really good friends on the boat. And we find that our socializing on land is most often with our crew. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And since since I have you guys here, oh, Keith, do you have anything to add to that or did Emily cover it? Yeah, no, I, I think she covered it. You, you know, I, I liken running a, a big boat program, right? And we sail with nine, um, sometimes eight to running a small business and so in the crew you you look for the same sort of qualities that if you're managing a small business the same sort of qualities you know reliability punctuality good attitude um, and you know so it's not very different from the sorts of uh, things you look for your employees or your workmates uh, you know so does that make sense Yes, it does. And do you guys have an assigned sort of crew boss on your boat? Right. Emily, uh, <laughs> Emily is, well, you came on uh, Jubilee once. and I know. And I remember you Jubilee. said, listen to yeah. Emily. 
<laughs> but it was so, good. I knew who to listen to. Yeah. So, you know, the, um, I like to drive and, and look outside the boat more than I suppose uh, I'm supposed to. But um, so I rely on Emily and, yeah, talk about that. Yeah, I, especially with the, the newer people with less experience, I trim the main so I have a good picture of what's happening in front of me on the boat. And um, I'm, all, I'm a special educator, I'm a teacher, so I can break things down to the basics um, and just try to let people know what may be coming up, what maneuvers might be happening, what their role is in those maneuvers. Um, with new people, making sure safety is, is um, an, of utmost concern. You know, before we jive, make sure you keep your head down and lean forward. And um, so I think it's a position where I can see a lot of stuff and can sort of quietly alert people to what's happening without making Keith have to focus on those things. Mm -hmm. We have some experienced crew that don't need any of that guidance, but it's the less experienced crew. Now just, just whisper in their ear, this is what's happening and this is what we expect you to do. Yeah. So I think it's worked out really well that way. So Keith can focus more on what he needs to focus on driving and, and like you said, what's outside of the boat. Yeah. And, so, and, uh, I was just going to finish off by saying, Aaron, one of our crew that's been with us since the beginning is, uh, hi, Maria. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, he, he kind of keeps an eye on things too and, and, and takes, uh, takes that responsibility away from me. So between Aaron and, and uh, Emily, they're keeping an eye on what's going on, the mechanics and, uh, you know, getting to the corners and, you know, what's going to happen. Um, so... How about you, Clark? Do you assign a, a crew boss on your boat? And, and welcome, Marianne. Thanks for joining Hi. us. We've been talking about you behind your back and how it's a good way to keep crew by marrying them. Well, I'm, I'm a more of a shore help is what I help with. Preparing him, getting him ready, lunches, and trying to have stuff ready for him when they get in and um, make every, keep, try to keep everybody happy. Yeah, the glue that holds it together, right? So... Yeah. We couldn't do it without her, for sure. And uh, she overheard some of the conversation already, and I got in trouble because I haven't mentioned that our kids sail with us, too. So that uh, we'll get around to that. <laughs> yeah. so they'll be around longer than you, me. So. <laughs> do you have someone who's in charge of the crew on the boat so that you can drive? Or do you drive? I, I, I think you do. Well... You know, we've right now we've got a, a crew that's probably been sailing together for about four years. And if everybody's in their primary position, we might take things for granted. And uh, we don't discuss things enough. And every once in a while, we run into a little chaos where we will go out and we will swap positions regularly like on Wednesday nights and so everybody can get a little taste of the different areas of the boat and uh, they've had to put up with me on the point uh, the front end of the boat uh, but I will I'm, I'm all the way around the boat um, uh, the <laughs> I am unusual on our boat because the whole crew is the, uh, my age of my son. And so uh, they might give me a little bit of extra tolerance to be in the cockpit more than, uh, than not. But hey, I like the challenge to get out of the cockpit too. Mm -hmm. Crew boss, I would say that if we have a crew boss, it's probably our partner Paul Caldwell, because he does much of the communication um, with all the crew members through the week and month and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's got a better skill as far as texting. And, uh, and I think it's very important to keep the communication lines open. That's yeah, I, was, I, I was talking about on the boat, but that completely extends to off the boat because somebody <laughs> needs to get the crew there <laughs> to yeah. the dock. And that, I mean, that's a big task. That's a lot of work, all that emailing. And um, I remember running into uh, 
local sale maker here in Annapolis one time and he said when you're at your crew party when you're giving people tips on on being a crew um, make sure to let them know they have to return emails and texts <laughs> You said because that that right there, if, if they're terrible communicators when it comes to email and text, that that's just unacceptable if they're going to be part of a team. Kind of like what you said, Keith, about it, like running a business. You can't be a business person and not answer your your phone and not not respond to your texts or let people know five minutes before party time. You know, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll be there today. Oh, well, we've known about this for three months, you know, so I think that's important too. So um, I'm going to start with you, Clark. And, and the question about um, when you do have some new people, it sounds like you haven't had some new people for a while, but when you do, how do you go about assigning roles on the boat? Is that, a, does that sort of happen naturally or? Well, we'll, we will normally have a nucleus of regulars on the boat and mm -hmm. We'll let uh, somebody jump in the fire if for some reason we're missing a, a trimmer. We'll let the, a new person come in and try trimming for a while. Um, if we're just trying to introduce somebody that's never sailed, maybe they'll be uh, closer to the companionway, the pit area of the boat, and that might a night that uh, I've had experience where I've just sat on the rail and uh, explained how things go around the boat and, and the workings and um, allow them to uh, get their hands wet by helping in the pit area a little bit, which can be a very fast action area of the boat at times. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I don't know. Uh, it's not uh, we always want to pass some kind of responsibility so they everybody that is on board the boat and we will sail with eight people on a 32 footer uh, sometimes seven or six but uh, we try to make sure that everybody has a active role in the success or our demise of the boat and um, when we have maybe is not going to be used to the loads, they'll sit behind the driver and just go along for the ride. Mm -hmm. How about you, Keith and Emily, assigning roles to people on the boat? You know, sailing with nine people, like I'm sure can be a challenge. How do you go yeah, about it? Uh, yeah, uh, we are lucky enough, like, Clark to have a nucleus. Uh, there's, uh, I guess, five of us that uh, have been sailing together for 17, 18 years or something. <laughs> it's scary to think about that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I always like to put people in positions where they're going to be successful and, uh, you know, I, I think they're going to be. Uh, a good fit. You know, I've, I've, I've tried to uh, accommodate people who said, "Ah, oh, you know, I'd like to try, you know, something or other," and then they get into a uh, into a spot where uh, they're not comfortable. Uh, they don't know what they're doing, and it becomes very frustrating. Uh, but uh, we we mostly have assigned roles, uh, especially with the nucleus, and even with you know the regular. We've got about eight or nine regulars, uh, so I consider myself fortunate in that regard. And we pretty much, you know, um, do the same positions every week. However, and Emily will tell you. Go ahead, Emily. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, I think what he's alluding to is that after racing, often Keith wants to get the sales down, protect the sales. Like them and start drinking, um, but I think it's a great opportunity if we finish it's enough time to do some more practicing and get the new people involved, switching positions. Yeah. So have the guy trimmer trim the spinnaker, um, and vice versa, so they get a, a feel for what's happening at either end. Have somebody drive the boat, um, even for example with the motor off and we're motoring in. 
a lot of our crew have never driven boats before. So getting the feeling of just driving the boat um, back to the marina. Um, I also want to add that with people like sitting on the rail with rail meet, you can also assign them roles. You know, you can ask somebody to keep an eye on the, the signal boat and make sure that they'll alert us if they see any flags for over early, for example. Or keep your eye on a, a given competitor and let us know if they tack or let us know if they jive. So people, yeah, people don't have to have physical roles sometimes, but um, just giving them something else to do, something to look for, which keeps their head in the game and keep, keeps them engaged and feeling part of the team. Mm -hmm. I know it's always worked for me when someone has said, Molly, talk to me. <laughs> oh, I can do that. Tell me about the wind. Tell me about this. Tell me about that. Like, all right, I, I can handle that, you know, yeah. a lot better than don't send me on the bow. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, yeah, the best opportunity to put people in other jobs is when somebody doesn't show up and then that creates the opportunity for people to move around and do other things and we, I always uh, welcome that and you know uh, it, it proves to be a great learning uh, experience for those uh, people as well. Mm -hmm. So I know um, Keith and Emily you guys occasionally have beginners on the boat and Clark I know you don't have any recently but I know you have had beginners on the boat you know can you walk us through how you get a beginner up to speed sort of or if you can think of a specific example of getting a beginner up to speed um, Oh, wait, what does he have there? That's a fancy round cake bottle you've got there. Where's that from? It's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I would start at the beginning, so before we've even left the dock. So with a beginner, I want to talk about the safety procedures. You know, what, what can you swim? Um, what to do if someone falls overboard? Um, the fire extinguisher is so some very basic safety PFDs, issues pfds yeah. um read the boat what these lines are you know from, from the back of the boat to the front what do they do um we always get them to rig the boat getting them to rig the boat yeah. um eventually you know with supervision because that can really mess things up if it doesn't it's a great know, way to learn if you're yeah. knitting it you know it's slow um, <laughs> And sailing boat, the, the vocabulary of the boat, what we call things, you know, whether you hoist a sail or raise a sail or drop it or douse it, you know, different boats use different terminology, and this is new for a lot of people. Um, so just going through the vocabulary, which they don't soak up in, you know, one conversation, but it's a repeated kind of conversation. So I just start there, and then I think when we get on the water, Keith would be guiding you know, the, the physical techniques of how to do certain jobs. Yeah, and you know, the, for the very naive or, or inexperienced, they sit behind me and, and cross over from side to side, and I, I encourage them to watch what's going on. And that's mm -hmm. what I find out, you know, is, is this somebody got something, you know, are they, are they actually absorbing this? Is, is there a, a sincere interest in figuring out what's going on and are they they're going to make it? So that's, and yet we have taken people on Jubilee who've had no experience, uh, and they've become wonderful crew. Yeah, they're still here. Yeah. A couple are still with us. Yeah, so it's worked out well, you know, because they're clear and open. There, um, there are a couple things I'm hearing you guys say that that we're not really labeling as training, but that that's actually what you actually train your crew. And I told Keith on the phone this week that I shot a note when I was in, still in panic mode. I shot a note to a friend and said, "Hey, you race a lot. Give me, give me a name of a skipper who's really good at, uh, you know, has a great cohesive crew and is really good at training." And she wrote right back, "The training piece is the tough one. Let me think on that." And I thought, how interesting. That's her first reaction. Oh, training us. You know, they might bring us on the boat, but do they train us? But I think your um, you know, your background in education, Emily, helps a lot. But what I'm hearing from you guys is that you have someone who's in charge of training people. You actually have a system for moving them around the boat. You have them learn how to rig the boat. You teach them the terminology of the boat. So you're actually walking them through the process of your boat. Sounds like probably where the fire extinguisher is. That's a, a crazy important thing to know that 
and I, I can tell you like on one hand in the past 25 years, how many people have told me where the fire extinguisher is when I step on their boat. So that's, uh, that's some key information. Uh, Clark, do you have anything to add to that for when you bring newcomers on your boat? Well, most of my boats that I've owned have been smaller. So they don't have as many holes in the bottom as Keith's big yacht that he has. <laughs> uh, in fact, is I've had very few boats that have had built-in heads and sinks in them. So uh, I, I do have uh, a 1976 Ranger 33 that we've played with recently with all the holes in the bottom. And, and you, then you really need to be concerned that people – know where the holes are in these boats. Oh, kitty. Because, because you might get some water in them. And, uh, you got to know where the water is coming from. And again, uh, on our current program, everybody has their own life jacket. They're all responsible for that. If come, somebody comes on board, we assign them a life jacket from the typical orange yoke type that fits over your neck. Not so comfortable. But with that, if they stay on for any time, they'll find themselves a nice vest and learn to be comfortable. Um, but, you know, you have to make sure that people are aware of safety issues because um, I want to be able to go out there and relax. And, and I might have a couple of adult beverages, but I want to make sure that the safety is taken care of before I get into that. And so we know that. We know that the end's going to come. We just don't want it to be a bad end. So, yeah. So, um, can you guys share a time when maybe you didn't train a crew member so well, and you looked back on it and thought, "Well, that didn't go well," and and maybe evaluated how you could have done better training them up? Anyone have an example of that? No, never. It's never. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, I didn't read. Uh, my son-in-law very well. We'd been out on Wednesday nights, nice flat water sailing around. And next thing you know, we did a boat delivery from Solomon's to Hampton. And man, he is a computer whiz. And he jumped right in and he could navigate the boat. And he has no background on the water whatsoever. But man, he fit right in. Well, then we ran into a situation where now we're, say, on the Henderson 30 in 30 knots of wind, and somebody was sick for a 30-mile race. Well, guess who hasn't been back on the boat? <laughs> Santa Claus even brought him uh, motion sickness pills. I don't know why, but that didn't seem to work either. <laughs> So now I have to play golf with my son-in-law because uh, he won't come out on the boat. <laughs> but his, his wife or my daughter and their kids are all going to be on the boat. So mm -hmm. we'll get Brett back on the boat. How about you, Keith and Emily? A time where maybe you guys didn't, didn't wasn't your best? I, I think we've, we've tripped up occasionally when we've had people – come on the boat new to Jubilee with their resume and, uh, you know, stories of uh, all of their exploits and and who they've sailed with and against and blah, blah, blah. And so we sometimes you um, take for granted that they really know what they're doing and you put them in a spot. And so I've found ourselves a couple of times in situations where we had somebody doing it's always when it's blown 30, not when it's blown 10, right? right. And, uh, you know, so we, we uh, the only time that Jubilee has gone down on its side and stayed there <laughs> was, was when somebody made, you know, a dumb mistake that uh, threw somebody off the boat and put Jubilee on its side. So um, he hasn't been back. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think there are a couple of those situations where you, you sort of put somebody in a, in a spot where you think they're going to be okay and mm -hmm. you haven't really checked them out and given them the information they need to be successful on our boat. It's not, not always their fault, but, you know, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Pete, so, uh, I thought you were going to talk about the, the day that Mike Ironmonger and I sailed with you guys at Harrington Harbor, and we had just a disastrous time mm -hmm. and a great uh, social uh, dinner afterwards. And I got late for a party at the Miser's house, and they never let me let it down. So. <laughs> <laughs> But can you imagine having Clark McKinney and Mike Ironmonger on your boat as crew? Um, <laughs> we had a wonderful day. And my crew, some of them still talk about that day, Clark, and the things that they learned from you. It was a wonderful experience. So thank you. Yeah, you know, I was saying there's no shortage of sense of humor with uh, Clark and Mike Ironmonger on the boat. And uh, to answer your question, Todd Johnson, uh, that Jubilee is at Beneteau, 36.7. And Rick Lougheed, yes, that is Clark McKinney. You need some new glasses, Rick, or you've got a tiny phone. And then we have a question from the audience here. Uh, Betty Caffo has asked a question. Do new crew offer different challenges based on their ages? College student versus older person. Anyone want to answer that one? I, I would say that new crew um, offer different challenges based on their physical fitness. Um, and so that may have to do with age, it may not. But you know, somebody who appears to be physically fit but hasn't worked out, um, or, you know, isn't actively exercising, you know, can just run out of gas while grinding. You know, for, so it's not such an of an age thing, but a fitness thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about you, Clark? Anything to add to that? I think it how totally has to do with what your boat, the platform you're sailing on. Um, certainly, the current platform, being the Melgis, uh, it likes to be a very athletic boat, and in particular when the breeze picks up. Um, but we've had uh, guest people join us that have been skippers that are more experienced or let's just say older than I am on board the boat. And we have two Melchus 32s and Solomons and we, we get into tacking duels and we find ourselves, uh, one of the restrictions is how agile people are getting from one side of the boat to the other. So, uh, we're glad that we didn't have to continue some tacking duel in this most recent fall series that uh, uh, we were losing every time we tacked. So anyways, um, yeah, you know, I think heavier boats that uh, might go through the water a little bit uh, smoother, uh, you don't have to be quite as nimble and, and have as good a balance. Mm -hmm. and, but then you might have to be stronger because yeah. the heavier boats have bigger sails and then you have to rely on people grinding and uh, pulling the sails in. And that's a whole different set of parameters than what we're doing now. Yeah, I interviewed some um, women skippers, um, you know, on one of these Spinchy Happy Hour programs. And one of the things that they said that I really heard, because we were saying, you know, what, are there some things that men can do on a boat that women can't do? And one of them said, usually has to do with upper body strength. So she works out. Um, you know, she really works on her upper body strength to make up for it, you know, so that she can do those things. And uh, if anyone would like to join me in doing yoga, I really believe it helps a lot with agility. <laughs> so um, yeah. we're, um, we're getting close to, um, to last call. So I wanted to ask you guys, and oh, I'll God. start with you, Keith, Keith and Emily. Um, what's your advice, and this can be advice on anything, to new skippers about training and keeping their crew? You could just give them a couple of good snippets on how to do it well and what you've learned over the years. Um, <laughs> I have this uh, saying um, that, uh, it, and it goes like this, hire well and fire well. So <laughs> um, as in... Uh, as in running a business. So make sure that, you know, when, when you find good people, keep them, uh, challenge them, take care of them. Uh, you know, with my early days of sailing as a crew member, I spent a number of years sailing with a fellow called Norm Dawley, who owns uh, Pursuit down in, uh, in Solomon's. And Norm and Stavey Brown, 
really showed me how the right way to run a program, take care of the boat, take care of the crew. Uh, and, and I think that uh, you know, when you find good people, be conscious. You, you have to be a bit of a psychologist sometimes or a psychiatrist to try and figure mm -hmm. out to, you know, how the chemistry is working and make sure that when you have somebody on the crew who's not and you know the chemistry is is not what it, it should be because Lord knows none of these people are getting paid so that you want to make sure they're having fun so if you find somebody who's not getting along or isn't working out even even if they are really good sailors make sure you fire them because you're much better off with a crew that's getting along um, even if uh, you have to hire a you know a hot shot or a rock star um, fire that guy and, and keep the crew together so that's my advice yeah, Emily, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I would add for new uh, skippers that if they're interested in having somebody come on the boat, don't make a commitment of, you know, can you crew for me this summer? Make a commitment, you know, we're looking for some crew. Would you like to come out as a guest on Wednesday night? You know, see, let's go. And then you've got that out that if it didn't go well, you're not disappointing somebody. You're not you know, reneging on that commitment. And this is the crew, you know, if, if they come and you think they're great, but they're not real happy, if they're a guest for that first or, you know, second race, they can say this has been fun um, and, and choose not to race with you anymore. So I wouldn't make a long-term commitment until you've spent some time with that person on the boat. Mm -hmm. Clark, do you have anything to add there? What's your advice to new skippers on training and keeping crew? Yeah. So I think it has to do with the size of the boat. And so, you know, a skipper might be able to do the crew boss position and skippering on a smaller boat. It was very easy on a J80 when you only have four people. And, and so the skipper can do that. You get on Keith's boat, eight, nine people. I think it's important to have that crew boss to allow the skipper to be part of the race to analyze the tactics that go in and not just uh, sh try to explain to each crew member what their task is and how to accomplish it. So, uh, again, it has to do with the size of the boat. And uh, and I'm just lucky not to be sailing a 50 footer. I like to crew on 50 footer, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, you guys have been great. I really appreciate your coming on, and we're at last call. So, um, unless there's a final right. question from the audience or from you, Sharb, I would say let's uh, yeah. cheers well, to you guys. Just and uh. Um, well, and we yeah. hope we'll come back as guests. Oh, yeah. Spin she uh, happy. Yeah. You know, we uh, there are only so many topics in sailing you can cover. So we, you know, sometimes we just we just come back to the same topics, and people are always interested, and they they still want to talk about it, no matter what it is. We are going to continue this conversation at the end of April. I believe it's April twenty third, whatever that Friday night is, um, and we are going to talk about you know some traits to become a better crew member and be the kind of crew that gets on a boat and stays on a boat and what you can do to um, to become a better crew member. But in the yeah. meantime, you know, we got some sailboat racing starting here on the Chesapeake and we have a lot to be fired up about, you know, in the month of April, which is next week. Yep. And uh, yeah, well, life is good, right? I think we need to break the news to our audience too um, in, in light of the racing that's coming up. Um, and the pleas uh, from all the regattas and uh, racing committees to not have spin sheet happy hour every Friday because they they they're not getting you know they're afraid they're not going to get the attendance. Um, people are going to rather watch us than go out and race on Friday nights. <laughs> um, so we are going to cut back a little bit during the racing season, um, and uh, and we'll have one maybe two spin sheet happy hours. Uh, uh, during the month. Um, so having said that, there is not a spin sheet happy hour on April 2nd, um, which is next week. Um, uh, but we will have one after that. And 
We won't have one during boat during the Bay Bridge boat show. Um, no. But then we're back on uh, before the end of the month. So we'll have two in April, not four. Yeah. And they're um they, they will be they're on the calendar and they're in the spin sheet calendar online at spinsheet.com. Uh, also for those who are listening and said crew finder service, I've never used your free crew finder service. What? You should be using it right now. Go sign up at spinsheet.com, click on crew finder, sign up make a profile, update your profile, and get yourself on some race boats this year because racing is on on the Chesapeake. It's, it's one of the best not, it's happening. Exactly. So we have yeah. If you have any trouble with the Spin Sheet Crew Finder, I made a very good instructional film video uh, <laughs> how to do it. So look for that on there too. You do. Uh, you called yourself like Chris Graybeard or something like that? Captain Graybeard. Captain Graybeard. <laughs> yes, of course. It's Captain it's original. Too. <laughs> All right. Hey, Clark, Keith, Emily, thank you very much for uh, for coming out here today. Um, and thank you, everybody, for uh, uh, coming to the Spin Sheet Happy Hour. I'm going to throw you guys in the green room. Uh, don't forget, don't leave. There's always a party in the green room. Party in the green room. Happy. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. Okay, bye. Um, so, everybody, thanks very much for tuning in. We really appreciate it. Um, one last thank you to Mount Gay Rum. Uh, for sponsoring this. This is this has been great. Um, and also I gotta give a quick shout out to Kevin Brooks, who's my neighbor, who saved me and brought me some ginger beer uh, to mix with my Mount Gay Rum. So thank you, Kevin. Uh, and uh, everybody else.